So I think a lot of people think that money is going to make us happy in a certain way. I do think money can make us happy, but for other reasons. Hello, and welcome back to the Better Than Rich Show. I'm your host, Andrew Biggs, and I'm here with my co-host, Micah Bromowitz. And we have a very, very special guest here today that we're so excited for you all to get to know. Uh, if you don't know Rachel Richards, uh, by the end of this interview, you will fall in love with her and her content. She really is amazing. Uh, Rachel, at the age of 27, was able to quit her job and fully retire. And now she's living off $20,000 a month in passive income. Okay, $20,000 a month in passive income, which is amazing. Uh, Rachel is a best-selling author uh, of, of a couple books. One is Money Honey, and the other is Passive Income, Aggressive Retirement. Uh, she was able to build a real estate portfolio of 38 different rental units by the age of 26. She's a formal financial uh, former financial advisor. Uh, she's been featured on, on CNBC, Forbes, Business Insider. Uh, she really is amazing. She makes the topic of money management fun, entertaining, and simple uh, for her over two, uh, 250,000 millennial followers. Uh, she's really awesome at helping women as well, uh, feel capable and confident in their financial futures. So, uh, you know, one other thing I'll just say about this, Rachel, is I just love how down to earth you are, to be honest, because I think so many people who are, you know, uh, got their shit, their financial shit together sometimes, uh, think that their shit doesn't stink. And I just love how your approach is just so relatable and down to earth. So that's, uh, welcome to the show, Rachel. We're so glad you're here and I'm, I'm so you. glad to have you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you both, Andrew and Mike. I'm super excited. I've been looking forward to talking to you all for a while. So thanks for having me. I can't wait to to get into it. It's going to be fun. Fantastic. Yeah. And what's cool is this is the first time we have like a, a, a three-way interview on this, on this podcast. So it's going to be super cool for us to just kind of bounce around and stuff. So, you know, as a starting point, I'd love to just kind of kick things off and say, you know, what inspired you to get going in, in sort of this career and to retire by 27? Like, why did you even want to do this in the first place? Uh, let's let's see and, and start to unpack this. Yeah, that's a great question. It kind of goes back to my childhood, the environment in which I was raised. I grew up in this really wealthy bubble in Kentucky. And just to give you an idea, like my friends were, they lived in mansions. Um, some of the kids in my high school got brand new BMWs when they turned 16. My family was not operating that way. We were my parents lived paycheck to paycheck. We struggled with money. We weren't going out on trips, let alone going out to eat at restaurants. So I remember growing up and feeling like I didn't fit in. And that's not the way you want to feel in middle school and in high school, right? So I remember thinking I didn't want to be like everyone else struggling with money. I didn't want to have to operate on a strict budget. I didn't want to have to borrow money from family and friends to make it to my next paycheck. I wanted to be different. And I remember thinking what I did then would either set me up for wealth or for poverty. So I got pretty motivated. I was a finance nerd from a pretty young age, and I got pretty motivated to figure out a way to achieve financial independence so that I could take care of myself and take care of my loved ones. I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad in high school, and that's what turned me onto real estate investing, and that was kind of my way out and just learned everything I could. Um, and that's what motivated me. You know, they say fear can be paralyzing or motivating. Luckily for me, it was very mo motivating to try to find a way out. Yeah. I, I and, and I think many of our listeners could relate to that where it's like, I wanted to get, you know, out of this uh, trap, you know, uh, of, of working and exchanging my time for money. But I can't say that everyone has done that. Um, so at what point did you realize it's like, okay, I got to get out of this trap and I'm going to start doing my own thing because that takes a little bit of a risk. And I think a lot of our listeners that are in, you know, entrepreneurs and starting their business and, you know, have taken that risk. But I, I, I think that, you know, hearing your story of how you were able to kind of cut ties with the past and pave way for a future, what did that look like for you? So for me, I was trapped in this very toxic workplace. I don't know if you all have ever worked for like an abusive 
emotionally abusive boss. Maybe not because Cutco people are well, awesome, right? Well, I know you're with a lot of Cutco people. But. <laughs> sli- we'll, go, we'll go with slightly emotionally abusive. But I've seen some stories on your on your social media where I'm like, holy crap, like this this woman or whatever that, that was leading you is just like yeah. clearly not fit to lead. So yeah, why don't you fill, fill us in? Yeah, she was just very condescending. I mean, I could tell story mm. after story, but mm. she made me cry. And not just me, okay? She made other people cry too. Um, <laughs> but I just got to the point where I kind of had my enough is enough moment. And I was like, well, I'm not going to continue to stay in a place and allow somebody to treat me this way. I'm not going to do this anymore. So I kind of began to think, how am I going to get out of this? How am I going to separate my time from my money? Because I certainly don't want to keep working from nine to five every day for the rest of my life. Right. I started to think about the way that we traditionally approach retirement. I call it the nest egg theory. Because what we've done in the past is we've worked for 40 years, a nine to five job. We've saved up a ton of money so that we can live off it when we turn 65 for the rest of our lives. Now that used to work really well, but times have changed and the way we've approached retirement hasn't changed at all, right? The costs of college have ballooned, placing an enormous burden on my generation. Social security trust fund is projected to be fully depleted by the year 2034. Pensions are a thing of the past. Inflation is at a 40 year high. There's appreciation in the housing market. Like, there's all these factors that are making it really hard to even afford to live right now, let alone even be able to retire at 65. So, I was like, this isn't going to work for me. And I don't want to work my butt off for somebody who's going to bully me for the rest of my life. So, how am I going to separate my time from my money? That's when I started learning about this thing called passive income. Now, I know you all are familiar with this phrase, but don't you think it's been sort of misused and misunderstood now? Like, people don't, yeah, like, I think people think it's a get rich quick scheme. It's this buzzword. Um, Passive income is not a get rich quick scheme. So, the way I define it is it's money that is earned with little to no ongoing effort. And that doesn't mean it's easy to do, that doesn't mean it's a get rich quick scheme. Um, There's a lot of passive income streams that still require a couple hours of work per week or a few hours per month to maintain. Now, some people would say, well, Rachel, that's not passive then. And you're right. It's not 100% passive, but it's still more passive than a a 40-hour-a-week job. And any passive income stream is going to take time or money to create the passive income stream in the first place. You don't just snap your fingers and it's magically there. But then once you have it going, it becomes very passive, very hands-off in the long run. I became obsessed with this idea. I realized that once your passive income exceeds your living expenses, you're financially independent. And I figured, well, it's going to be a lot easier, you know, instead of having to come up with a million or $2 million by age 65 to retire, it's going to be a lot easier to come up with five or six or $8,000 a month in passive income to cover my expenses. So that's what I set out to do. So that's my long-winded answer, Mike, of of how I sort of started my journey of creating passive income so that I could leave my job. I love it. I think it's a great answer. In fact, I had a, uh, when I read your book, I got my first REIT uh, and I put five grand into it and I was like, all right, let's just see what this does. And I get like, I don't know, maybe it pays me 25 to $50 a month here and there, but that's truly passive income. Like I literally set it up a couple of years ago, haven't done anything with it and it pays me this extra little money. And then I did another deal that pays me $300 a month without doing anything. So using the exact concepts that you have in your book and uh, funny enough, something you might not know is I had passive income in high school. For those of you that watch, listen to the show, um, I had a vending machine in my, uh, in my house and I would throw parties in my house and uh, that brought in a lot of passive income. So they would buy, I would buy them at 20, 25 cents a piece candy bars and sell them for 65. So got the little extra passive income with the vending machine back in the day. So, yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> Wait, you put a vending machine in your house? Yeah, my mom was my best customer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that is the best thing I've ever heard. <laughs> That's awesome, I love it. Man. I love it. <laughs> I, I think I, I really like the idea. I mean, pa- I like how you define passive income, right? Which is, you know, it takes little or or no effort to maintain because there is a lot of misconceptions, right, around passive income. 
And I also love this financial freedom equation you have of like when your passive income exceeds your living expenses, you're financially free. So yeah, this is uh, this is really helpful. I'm, I'm curious from your side, like what are what are some of the other misconceptions? I mean, you mentioned kind of like this traditional nest egg theory. What's the new way? What's what's the millennial, the Gen Z way, right, to get rich and retire early from your perspective? What, what's coming up for you there? Oh, there's a lot of ways. I think pa- the passive income method t- is my favorite. But I think another thing that's changing in terms of ways to achieve financial independence is there's this shift towards frugality from frugality towards abundance. You know, it used to be achieve financial independence by being extremely, extremely frugal. And a lot of people in the like nerdy financial independence world, not that it's nerdy, I claim nerdy as like a good thing. Um, They, you know, they called that lean fire. So it's like, get my expenses as low and low and low as possible. That way I don't have to save nearly as much to become financially independent. So if my expenses are only $1,000 a month, then I only need to create, you know, $1,000 a month in income streams to retire or have way less money saved as a nest egg to retire. I think people are kind of sick of that. They don't like to be so restricted. I know that when I wanted to retire, I wanted to travel the world, right? I wanted to live in nice places. I don't want to eat like ramen noodles for the rest of my life personally. Some people do, fine. And that's great. Like do whatever you want. But for me personally, I was like, I'm not interested in that. I don't want to be restricted. Um, So there's this shift towards fat fire, which is how can I have like this fat nest egg? You know, how can I have really big passive income streams so that I can just do whatever I want? And that's what I went for. So initially, my goal was to get to $10,000 a month in passive income. And that was more than enough to cover my living expenses and still save a really good amount of money. And that meant I could travel the world. I can live in nice places. I can do whatever I want and just not have to worry about being restricted or cut back on anything. So I think that's another, I guess, misconception or just trend that I'm seeing with millennials and Gen Zers. And and one of those millennials or Gen Zers, how how much would you say they need to have, uh, you know, saved up or started if they if they wanted to like start putting their money to work? Do you have a theory or or like a um? You know the bu- you know, you hear the buckets approach like fill this bucket and then it fills over to this bucket and then it fills over to this bucket like what's your philosophy on that for someone who wants to get started on this? So I do have a savings bucket method in my book Money Honey, and really the way that my savings buckets works and I love that you're holding it up um, and if you all there might be like two different covers if you all look up a Money Honey on Amazon but so thank you Mike I appreciate it so I'll give a quick overview of the savings buckets I used to be very confused at the idea of saving how much do I need where do I put my savings you know I'm saving for different things so where do I allocate that how do I do that all at once it was very confusing to me so that's why I thought of the savings buckets With the savings buckets, you save according to the timeline of when you're going to need that thing. So you have four savings buckets. With savings bucket number one, this is just an emergency expense bucket. It's not really even an emergency fund. It's like save for expenses that are going to come up in an emergency. So I recommend having $1,000 in this bucket. And you want to keep this very liquid. Keep it in cash. Keep it in a checking account. Keep it where you can access it. This is for things that come up that are unexpected, that you can't predict. You know, your dog swallows a tennis ball or whatever. You have to go to the vet. Um, Something, Some kind of medical emergency happens. So that's what that is for. And what this does is it prevents you from going into credit card debt. This prevents you from having to use that credit card and set yourself back further. So that's what that is for. So do that first. That's the very first thing you do. Then you have bucket number two. This is for medium-term expenses. And this is really your emergency fund. You want to have at least three to six months worth of expenses set in here. And another way to look at it is you want to save up for items that you're going to need in the next 12 months. Okay, save up for items that you're going to need in the next year. Now, I still, with this bucket, I don't recommend investing this in the stock market. You want to keep this in like a high yield savings account, something that's still pretty accessible because you still are going to need it in the pretty short term. It still is an emergency fund. And if you put it in the stock market, it can be volatile. You could lose money there in the short term. Plus, if you put it in the stock market and sell it, you're going to have to pay short-term capital gains taxes if you sell it within a year. Okay, so that's bucket two. Then you have bucket three. This is for long-term expenses, things that are more than a year away but before retirement. 
This is normally your bigger ticket items like your wedding engagement fund or engage, engagement ring fund, um, house, you know, car, anything big that you're going to purchase in the long term. Since this is the long term, it could be 10, 20 years, you can invest this in the stock market since you have more time and it's going to grow a lot more. And you don't want to put this in the retirement account, but just a normal tax account, you know, something that is going to be taxed and exactly a discount brokerage account. Um, and then you have bucket number four. This is a retirement account, 401k, traditional IRA, Roth IRA. This is where you're going to be saving money for retirement. And you really want to be saving to bucket number four consistently, even if it's just a little bit of, per month to start yourself off, even if it's 20 bucks a month. But otherwise, you're going to fill up the buckets consecutively. So fill up bucket number one first, then bucket number two, and then bucket number three. So that's the savings bucket strategy. That's in money, honey. But that gives you a high level overview of how to save and invest your money. Sorry, I'm leading this. But when there, where does the passive income come into play? Is that like bucket five or after these four are filled up? Or do you separate like two and three? Or So that's a good question. It's kind of interwoven. Um, when you are creating passive income, I do suggest that you have a solid foundation in place. When you're creating passive income, I really would like to see that you don't have any high interest consumer debt. So you don't have any credit card debt. I would like to see that you're consistently contributing to a retirement account, that you have an emergency fund saved up already. Um, if you have things like that, you have a good solid foundation, you know, you understand the importance or the, the basics of personal finance. That's when it's time to sort of take that next step and invest into creating some passive income streams. So you can almost take what you have saved in bucket number three, that long-term savings bucket, and start investing that money into creating passive income streams. So does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Awesome. Awesome. So I think uh, I, I'm definitely curious to see how the how they passive income is interwoven with the personal finance. Just sticking with the personal finance for a second, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see people make? You know, just general, you know, your, I think your first book was get your financial shit together, right? And it's like... So many people are just stuck in that. They can't even think about investing in passive income streams because they don't have their financial shit together. So what would you say are the biggest mistakes that you see on just that step? Uh, and then we can dive into the, the how to make more money. But just even just managing your money on a daily basis is a problem for so many people. Okay. This is such a great question, Andrew. So there are many mistakes. I'm glad you asked this because I like to clarify. And a lot of these are just around a misunderstanding. So so let me just back up and say this first. We have a financial education crisis. At no point in our lives are we taught how to manage our money. And then we're left as young adults to figure it out all on our own. No wonder we're left feeling guilt, shame, embarrassment about our the way that we don't know how to manage our money. And I hate to see that. So if any of you listening feel like, feel those feelings, it's not your fault. So I just want to alleviate you of that. It's not your fault that you weren't given the resources you need to succeed. I see a lot of misunderstanding, lack of education around this. So I just want to first approach everyone with the fact that this is a shame-free, judgment-free space. And what I do is I just try to educate people so they can empower themselves. So none of this is coming from like judging or shaming or anything. So just putting that out there because I'm very passionate about this. It gets me very fired up and I hate to see like women especially um, feel that way. Okay. So back to the mistakes. A lot of students and young people I work with have a misconception that it's a good idea to carry a low balance or some type of balance on their credit card because they think that that helps their credit score or like from a credit utilization perspective, they think that they need to carry a balance on their credit card. And I've heard this from a lot of people, um, but really the best thing to do with your credit card is not to carry a balance at all and to pay your balance off each month. Because if you carry a balance, you're actually paying a really high interest rate. Normally the interest rate on your credit card is 15, 20, 25%. That's a huge interest rate, and that's actually a really obstacle if you're working towards financial independence or just to have a really good, solid foundation from a personal finance perspective. So the best thing to do, set your credit card up on auto pay, pay that balance off every single month, and you'll be very, very strong from a credit score perspective as well. And then another mistake I see people make, Andrew, is with investing. 
So there's always the great debate about active investing versus passive investing. And I think a lot of young people get caught up in the whole like day trading, crypto, NFTs, buy a single stock and try to sell it at a higher price. And I know all that stuff sounds like really sexy and glamorous. I do. I get it. And when you see all these people making a ton of money online and bragging about it, it's hard not to get caught up in that. The thing is, like that stuff is very short-lived. There have been a lot of studies done that show that none of those things have consistently outperformed like an index fund or a passive fund or the S&P 500. Like study after study after study show that none of these things just beat the overall stock market. So the best thing to do is really boring, actually. What I do from an investing perspective is I invest in low-cost index funds. These are things that you can invest in one fund, and it invests in all these different stocks for you. So it automatically diversifies your portfolio. I like to invest in um, ETFs, index funds. Again, I know it sounds boring, but boring equals sexy in the long run. So that's what I do, and I think that is one of the best ways to approach it if you are investing for the long run. Awesome. Boring equals sexy in the long run when it comes to your finances. I love that. And, uh, and yeah, I see that all the time. I mean, I, I had a client, you know, put like 50 grand into Bitcoin and when it was at like 60 grand, you know, it's like, everyone's making money, you know, that, that irrational exuberance. And there's like, I'm going to throw all my money into Bitcoin. And it's like, well, maybe it'll work. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we need a we need a strategy. We need to diversify. We cannot be caught up in sort of the these you know moves and shakes in the market. And that's why that diversification strategy is so important. So, so thanks for that. I'm going to kick it to you, Mike, so you can talk about how to make more money. Yeah, I I, I want to know these money making vehicles. So so I, I think our audience ultimately a lot of our message, Rachel, on the Better Than Rich show, and and a lot of what our audience is following us for is how to free up some of their time. And this passive income is a really great gateway to help them free up their time where they're not so uh, strapped to work inside their business so much where I have to like work 24 seven to make cash flow. It's if I have cash flow from my business and I take that cash flow and put it to work where it's producing more cash flow, where what are some what are some ways to do this? Uh, again, I know what I've taken from your tutelage with uh, the REITs, with uh, some of the real estate like passive real estate investments. I have a conversation coming up with uh, your referral about syndications. I would love for you to riff on some syndications. I'm listening to some of his content. I'm like, you know, storage units, syndications, and you know, apartment complexes. And I don't even I don't even know how to spell syndication. I'm still really not equipped to even talk about it at all because I'm learning, but. Uh, you know, these are some things that I would love for our audience to get exposed to of truly taking, okay, they're already established in their business. They're making close to six figures or more. What do I do with this capital? How do I make my money and put it to work for me so I can free up some of my time uh, where I don't need to exchange my time for, for income? Okay, cool. Um, I love this topic. I I outlined 28 different passive income streams um, in my second book. So trust me when I say there is something out there for everybody. All you need to do is find one. <laughs> I love, Mike, that you're modeling the book. All you need to do is find one that'll work for you. And I really look at it in terms of different categories. There's royalty-based income streams. There's a, like affiliate and e-commerce income streams portfolio income, um, coin-operated machines, and then real estate investing. Now, my personal favorite is real estate investing, and I can tell why. I can explain why for several reasons. And if you're trying to figure out which category or which income stream to start, I always narrow it down from a time versus money perspective. Which do you have more of? Do you have more free time or do you have more money? If you were like me a few years ago, you would say, I have neither, right? I don't have any time and I don't have any money. <laughs> so the next question to ask yourself is, which, gonna, which is going to be easier for you to create right now? Is it going to be easier for you to free up a little more time or to generate some extra income? Because you need one or the other to create a passive income stream. Some of the royalty-based income streams like creating and selling an online course or self-publishing a book, those require a lot more time than money. The portfolio income streams, like investing in the stock market to make dividends, those require a lot more money than time. 
And then all of the different real estate investing ones, it just depends. Some of them you need time, some of them you, you need money, it just depends. Um, but Mike, I'm happy to talk about syndications. Let's just start there and then you can ask me about whichever other ones sound interesting. So syndications, let's just start with what are they? Because they're pretty new. Not a lot of people know what they are. A syndication is when an investor goes and finds, let's say as an example, a $10 million apartment complex. She can't afford to buy it on her own. So she forms something called a syndication. What this syndication allows her to do is raise money from private investors and pool this money together to buy this apartment complex. So you and I are the private investors. We can invest into this syndication. Now, we're not just lending the syndicator our money and earning interest. We are actually equity owners in this apartment complex. We own a small piece of it. What that means is we are entitled to a share of profits. So we get a share of the cash flow each quarter. And if the apartment complex ever sells, then we get a share of the profit when it sells. What I love about syndications is that we, as the private investors, we're like silent partners. We don't have to do any work. We're not managing tenants. We're not doing renovations. We're not finding the property. We just send our money in. And once we do that, it's completely passive. This is a 100% passive income stream. After that point, we are just collecting a quarterly distribution. So for that reason, it has become one of my absolute favorite uh, passive income streams because you own real estate, you get all these benefits, it's completely passive. Um, now, there are some barriers to entry. Normally, the minimums for these syndications are around twenty-five dollars to $50,000. So for me, I was like, oh, I don't, I don't have anywhere near that much money starting out. So this wasn't something I could do starting out. This is something that I just started doing in the last couple of years. Also, for some of these syndications, not all, you have to be an accredited investor. So you have to have a certain net worth or income in order to invest in them. Um, and, but that's a high. Go ahead. We, and just so we have that, it's 200,000 individual, 300,000 household or a net worth of a million dollars. Is that right? Yeah. A net worth of a million dollars, excluding your primary residence. Yes. So that's correct. Um, but yeah, that's high level overview. What questions do you have or, or what else? So as far as a, a, a rate of return, so mm -hmm. if, if the market hypothetically gives that steady eight to 10%, let's call it over time, um, you know, and then you could go like cash value life insurance, which I know we've had exchanges on, which is like that four to 11%, and then you could borrow against it. Um, and then right now I just put 50 grand into a real estate deal where they just pay me 8% annual with monthly distributions. So it seems like a lot of these passive income deals are around that eight to 10%. Is that what you're finding too? Or are these syndications uh, a much higher return because there is a little bit of a risk there or it, since it's minimal risk, um, it's not as high of return. Like what, what, what is, what is a good rate of return for our money to be working for us for, for creating some of these passive income streams? So it's, it can be pretty complex with when you're talking about the cash on cash ROI versus the annualized ROI versus like, there's all these different terms that syndicators used. Um, in general, when you're looking at both the cash flow you're going to be making during the term of the investment, plus any profits when it sells, a lot of these syndicators project that you'll make in the mid-teens to low 20s as, a, as an ROI on an annualized basis. So that's kind of spreading out all of the profits that you'll make total just spread out over an average per year. And do they um, usually create a term that, hey, we're planning on selling this apartment complex within this many years? Or yes. is it like, because if they buy and hold it, then great, I'm sitting there waiting for that return or, or that cash out. Um, yeah. With the syndication, they'll normally say this is a three-year, five-year, seven-year, 10-year. Most of them I've seen are about five years. Some of them are 10 years as well. So it is a longer-term play. And these aren't... You can't invest and then two years later decide, I want my money back. That's not how it works. It's, it's, it's illiquid. You can't just sell your share. So, And there's, there's risk also. There's risk with any investment you make, whether it's in the stock market, whether it's your own rental property, or whether it's in a syndication. You can lose all the money you invested. So it's very important on these syndications that you are doing due diligence on the syndication, but more importantly, on the syndicator, the person putting this investment together, because they are the ones who are ultimately going to be operating this, managing this, they need to have the experience, the knowledge, 
they need to know what they're doing because they're they're really the ones in charge. Well, the gentleman you recommend me to, his book is awesome. I devoured it already, his audio book. And oh, is uh, that Chris? That is Chris. I want, I didn't Good. know like if he wants to be uh, you know publicized or not, but yeah. Chris oh yeah, is. he's great. I talk about him all the time. If anyone listening wants an intro to some of my like favorite. Um, syndicators that I've personally invested with, I'm happy to do that. So just, you know, message me, email me. I'm happy to help. Yeah. I love what you said about <clears throat> it's all risky, right? You know, and it re reminds me of that Jim Rohn quote, right? It's all risky, right? You think investing is risky. Wait till you get the bill for not investing. Right. And, uh, you know, it's, it's everything is risky as we, as we're approaching things. And I've seen some people who sit on cash and I'm like, have you looked at inflation? Like you are losing money sitting on, you know, 50 grand in cash because you're afraid to put it in the market. You know, what are you going to do? You need to put, put it somewhere where it's going to work for you. Um, I, I want to talk about real estate in general. You're somebody who is big into rental properties. Um, let's say there's a listener listening. They're doing pretty well. They've cleared off all their debts and they have, you know, a, a small, you know, 10, 20, 30, 50, 50 grand uh, sort of saved up that they want to throw at real estate. How do you start thinking about that? Like guide them to, to start thinking about how to look at rental properties, how to evaluate them. Uh, what are your, your go-to sort of um, ideas around this? Y'all are asking me my favorite questions about real estate investing. So I love it. <laughs> okay. And, and why real estate? Well, what are the benefits of real estate? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's do why. And then we'll talk about how. So why real estate? This is my favorite passive income stream because it's not just about the passive income. There are all these other financial benefits that go along with it as well. So about a month ago, I came up with this acronym. I think it's pretty genius if I do say so myself. <laughs> it's called ELITE, okay, E-L-I-T-E, -E, and it outlines the five benefits for real estate investing. So when you invest in a rental property, you get E. So you get, I'll probably forget this as I go, but you get E, you get the equity buildup. So when you invest in a rental property, you're paying a, a down payment, and then you have rental income that is covering your mortgage payment for the entire time that you own the property. So after 30 years, you own a property free and clear having only paid the down payment. And now you own a property free and clear because of all this equity buildup that's happening. So that's one. Then you have L, which stands for leverage. You can buy a rental with other people's money, with bank financing, with a mortgage. You don't have to have 200 grand to buy a $200,000 house. You just have to have a 20% down payment. That's huge. You can't do that with a lot of other investments. Then you have I, which is for the income, the income stream that you get. So your rental income minus your mortgage and all of your other expenses leaves you with a monthly profit. To me, this is the most valuable part because I wanted to create passive income streams so that I could retire early. So that is the income part of it. Then you have T, which is for tax benefits. You have a lot of tax benefits, depreciation, a lot of other things that are great for you as a real estate investor, and that can help you offset active income as well. The final E is for expected appreciation. And I put expected there because we can't always count on appreciation to happen. Appreciation is when the price or the value of the property goes up over time. It doesn't always happen as we saw in 2007, 2008, but when it does happen, it's sort of an extra bonus. So that's expected appreciation. Those are the five benefits. That's why I think it's one of the best ways to invest and to build long-term wealth. I really do think that every young person should own a rental property because it can do so much towards creating a really solid financial future for you. So that is why. And then to get to your question, Andrew, you said, what should we be looking for? How do we get started? So what I would say, there's a few things to decide on first in terms of your strategy to take when you want to invest in a rental property. So first, it's about deciding, for example, between do I do a short-term rental or do I do a long-term rental? To me, this is a time versus money trade-off. With Airbnb short-term rentals, there's a lot more money to be made. Like my friends that do, I don't do Airbnb, but my friends that do this, they make way more money than me but they work harder for it, right? You have more tenant turnover. You have to schedule somebody to clean the property every few days. You have to be available for people. Even if you have a property management, you're going to be managing the manager. So you do have to be more hands-on. Um, so that is a time versus money trade-off. If you have a long-term rental with a tenant that's there for a year, you're just not going to have to do much. I spend maybe a couple hours a month to manage my long-term rentals. 
my tenants never call me. They never need anything. So that's the difference. Then you have to also think about the condition of their property. Do you want something that's move-in ready or are you willing and able and ready to do a full renovation? And if you're a new investor, you know, it is easier to just find something that's move-in ready or, you know, that just needs a coat of paint or whatever. Um, You have to think about price, right? How much money do you have? With most investment properties, if you're not going to live there, you have to come up with a 25% or 20% down payment. Now, there's a lot of creative ways around that. There's a lot of things you can do. So don't let that be an obstacle. You can live in the property and house hack. You can do the burr strategy. You can find a silent partner. There's a lot of ways, but price is a factor and you, you kind of have to figure that out. And then the last thing, and this is a question I get all the time, is location. Where do I invest? What's the best market to invest in? I used to think, well, I, I need to invest where I live, right? Like that's just what you do. But then I learned that might not make the most sense. I got lucky and I invested in Louisville, Kentucky, which is where I lived. And that, that place happened to be a very good market. But people who live in California or Austin, Texas or Denver, where I live now, or Washington, D.C., those markets are really, really expensive. So you might not be able to invest there. There's a few factors that I look at when I'm considering location. The biggest one is how affordable is the market. It's a big difference when you're buying a million-dollar property in California versus a $200,000 property in Indiana. Okay, so how affordable is it? And then I really suggest that you look at how landlord-friendly is the city or state. Now, what does that mean? I like to look for states that have property taxes that are about 1% or lower. So like average property taxes are lower. Also, you want to have rights as a landlord. You want to be able to evict your tenants if they can't pay. You want to have rights over your own property. And like without getting too political, okay, this is kind of normally the states that are red, okay? That's normally the more landlord-friendly states, if you're wondering. Um, And then the last factor is, is, uh, am I familiar with the city? And yeah, if you live there, you're going to be familiar with it. But you can also think about things like, did I used to live there? Did my family used to vacation there? Do I have friends there? Do I have networks there? If you have anyone in that city, it's just going to give you a leg up and just you'll have boots on the ground. You'll have somebody there that can point you in the right direction. So and if anyone just wants the easy answer, okay, I'll give you some of my favorite states. My favorite states to invest in from an affordability cash flowing perspective are Kentucky Indiana, Tennessee, and Ohio. I think those are all really, really solid markets. Um, so, so what else? I know that was a lot of information, but I hope that was helpful. <laughs> well, that's that's awesome. I mean, it's such so, so detailed. So, if you didn't catch all that, go back and and make sure you take notes on what Rachel just shared uh, as you're listening here today, because there are some really good nuggets in there. Uh, both the elite strategy and then you know looking at short term versus long term, moving ready versus a fixer upper price. Uh, you know, location, et cetera. By the way, Rachel, you got to check out Fayetteville, Arkansas. I'm telling you, it's college town, you know, landlord friendly. I'll, I'll give you the, I'll give you the scoop on Fayetteville if you want to check it out. So um, awesome. I'll add it to the list. I right. love it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Mike, I think you had a question. Yeah. I was just curious if, uh, you know, where does someone find uh, a good one of these deals? Like if they, so they did, they check all those boxes. That's cool. I looked in these places like, is there a database that they should, that we could look at? Uh, selfishly, I'm asking for myself. I mean, realistically, I don't, listeners, you know, do it. you know, go for you. But like, if I wanted to go find some of these deals, I'm sitting on, you know, 50 to 75 grand, maybe a hundred that I could invest. And I want to go find one of these deals. What do I do? Where do I go to go? You know, can I, can I just pay someone to go find this for me? Is that, a, does that exist? There's a lot of ways, and that's a good question. I think the mistake a lot of people make is looking on the MLS, looking on Zillow, working with an agent. And I, I shouldn't say mistake. It's just that it's what everyone else does. So it makes it more yeah, difficult it to find a good deal. Yeah. Exactly. It's more saturated. Um, if you want to find a good deal in this market, because this market's incredibly difficult, it is cooling down a little bit, but it's still really hard. If you want to find a good deal, you have to do what other people are not willing to do. So one of the things I teach a lot is how to find off-market deals. 
And I'll just kind of list them because we don't have time to get to get into it right now. And I'm happy to if you want me to. But just to give you some ideas that you all can Google research, or I talk about this on my Instagram too, there are things like looking up pre-foreclosure leads, short sale leads, driving for dollars, bandit signs, foreclosure auctions, tax deed auctions, probate leads, networking. Um, those are most of them. So there's a lot of different ways you can find off-market deals. And that's where you're going to find deals that give you you know, $200 a month in cash flow per door or 12% cash on cash ROI. So that's what I would recommend and does, doing. does anyone have a specialized place in the marketplace where that's all they do is they find these deals and then you could just pay them to have access to those deals? Like Because yes. the time to go find them and go look at all of them up, I don't have time for that. But if someone has already has that whole that space in the marketplace, does that exist? Yes, that's called wholesaling. So there are people that wholesale deals and they do exactly what you just said. So they will go out and they'll find these off-market deals for you and then they'll sell the deal to you. And normally you pay them a fee. It could be five, 10, 15 grand. Um, but a good wholesaler is obviously worth his or weight, his or her weight in, in gold because you're not going to have the time to do it. And there should be plenty of margin left for both of you to make a lot of money on this deal. Now, the trick is finding a good wholesaler because a lot of people call themselves wholesalers, but they don't really know what it takes to find a good deal. They might think it's a good deal, but it's actually only okay. So don't just take somebody's word for it. You have to make sure you're doing your own due diligence and agree with the numbers and um, do your own estimates and your own projections on the deal before just buying it from them. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the questions, uh, Rachel, that we ask every single one of our guests is, what does it mean to you to be better than rich? And I'm curious to hear your thoughts here on the spot. What does it mean to you to be better than rich? <laughs> That's a beautiful question. I have thought about this a lot over the years. And one of the things I just was thinking about the other day, actually, I was as I was putting together another social media post, <laughs> is that, you know, a... $500,000, a $500,000 house and a $100,000 house hosts the same amount of happiness or loneliness. A Michael Kors watch and a Forever 21 watch both tell the time the same way. Um, a smartphone and a flip phone both allow you to call your loved ones around the world. So I think we get caught up in a lot of materialistic things that we think are going to make us happy. And personally, I have found that those things don't add to my happiness. So I think a lot of people think that money are, is going to make us happy in a certain way. I do think money can make us happy, but for other reasons. Because money can allow us to escape a toxic workplace. Money can allow us to feel financially secure. Money can allow us, if we're going through a really difficult time, to escape and go to Europe and heal and not have to worry about a paycheck hanging over our head or financial stressors or paying our next bill. Money can allow us to be healthy and to get the medication and the healthy food that we need. So I think money can buy us happiness, but just through things that maybe most people wouldn't think about. Um, to me, being wealthy is about like happiness and health and relationships and when you really think about those things, those things aren't something that money can even buy. So at the end of the day, we all want the same things. And that's what being better than rich means to me. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Love yeah. Uh, I have a follow-up question. What do you think the world needs most of today? Love. That's it. And what are one to three books that you think people should read? Ooh. My favorite all-time book is Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. Have you read the, either of you I'm read that? I'm listening to the audio book, yeah. yeah. I'm like obsessed with him. And I didn't realize this, but people are just catching on to that. I'm a big fan of David. And so they'll just send me stuff all the time. They'll be like, oh my gosh, I know you love David. Like, look at this. And I'm like, I love that people know that I'm a David Goggins fangirl. So, <laughs> um, so that's one. Also, what else? Um, as you both know, I'm a big fan of Hal Elrod. So the Miracle Morning was definitely life-changing for me. And gosh, there's so many. These are just more life books. Um, there's a lot of finance books too. The Millionaire Fast Lane by MJ DeMarco was a big one for me. Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Uh, that's four. So I'll stop there. I could name books all day long. <laughs> well, thank you. We appreciate it. I mean, I mean David Goggins, if, you, if you're listening, you haven't read Can't Hurt Me, the audiobook is amazing because it's even 
there's like yes. interviews mixed in with his, uh, with his editor and all sorts of things. So, well, hey, I know that we are uh, about to close up. Rachel, where can people learn more about you and, and what can you kind of uh, leave the audience with here today uh, as we depart uh, here today? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Both of my books, Money, Honey, and Passive Income Aggressive Retirement, are available on Amazon in ebook, audiobook, and paperback. And you all can follow me on Instagram. Money, Honey, Rachel is my username. And what I'd love to do for your listeners is for anyone out there listening, if you would like to download my Passive Income Starter Kit, I will give that for free. So you can go to moneyhoneyrachel.com forward slash passive income to download that. Awesome. So moneyhoneyrachel.com backslash, sorry, forward slash. Forward slash. Passive income. Passive income. income. So make sure you check that out. Thank you so much for extending that to our audience. We really appreciate it. And we appreciate your time. I know it's valuable. And uh, I know that someone listening to this is going to have their life changed because of this interview. So thank you so much, Rachel, for your kindness, uh, your generosity, and um, and your your authenticity. We really appreciate it. Mike, anything else you want to say before we leave for the exits? No, I just, uh, thanks, Rach. I appreciate you uh, for making the time and uh, listeners, obviously, you know, go follow Rachel. She puts out awesome content on Instagram as well. And uh, she has an awesome Facebook group too, the Money Honeys Facebook group. So, and assuming this episode helped you, please turn around, share with others, uh, help a friend. Uh, We have lots of really great content on our Better Than Rich show. So you can subscribe to our YouTube for more. Uh, We always appreciate the rating and reviews on Apple and Spotify. So, you know, thank you for that. And uh, Biggs, here it is. What's up, guys? Biggs here. I hope you enjoyed that clip. Uh, If you did, go ahead and check out the other video that's being recommended on the screen right now. You can also subscribe to our channel. And then if you really are interested in what we do, go to AutomateDelegateSystemize.com to learn more about what we're up to. Thanks again.